Welcome to the Pharmacy Future Leaders Podcast with your host, Tony Guerra. The Pharmacy Future Leaders is part of the Pharmacy Podcast Network, focusing on pharmacy student perspectives, interviews, and the future outlook of our pharmacy industry. This is Amanda Kavnis, staff pharmacist with Kroger Pharmacy, and you're listening to the Pharmacy Podcast. Welcome to the Pharmacy Podcast Network. I'm your co-host, Tony Guerra, for the Pharmacy Future Leaders Podcast, broadcasting from the Des Moines Health and Public Services Building at DMAX Ankeny Campus. Connect with me on Facebook at TonyFarmD1, or you can find over 800 pharmacy videos supporting my audiobook, Memorizing Pharmacology, and new book, Goodnight Farm, 350 Brand and Generic Names with Classification, read again by Scottish narrator James Gillis. Today, we're talking with Amanda Kavnis, 2016 graduate of the University of Tennessee College of Pharmacy. She served in various leadership roles with APHA ASP, IPSF, and the Tennessee Society of Student Pharmacists. She's currently a staff pharmacist with Kroger Pharmacy. Welcome to the Pharmacy Podcast. Hey, thank you. I'm so excited to be here today. Well, everyone's leadership road is a little bit different. Um, Generally, I'm interviewing someone who's P4 or uh, just started out in residency or something like that, uh, but you've taken a, a kind of a year in between. Um, so uh, tell us a little bit about what's going on with you and how you got there. Yeah, so right now I'm serving as the new practitioner mentor for the University of Tennessee APHA ASP chapter, and I'm also a member of the IPSF Student Exchange Committee. Um, When I was in pharmacy school, I started on the chapter level with APHA ASP at my school, um, then moved into some national leadership roles on standing committees, um, some state levels with Tennessee Pharmacists Association, and then gradually moved to um, some international roles within IPSF. So um, tell me uh, a little bit more about how you kind of worked and developed into these roles. So uh, let's say you're Uh, First of all, University of Tennessee, you said you went to Memphis for undergrad. Did you do four years, then four years, or did you do two, then four? How did you do it? Um, My road was a little different from most traditional paths. I did four years of undergrad at the University of Memphis, and then I actually took a four-year break before I decided that I wanted to go to pharmacy school, and then I did four years at the University of Tennessee for pharmacy school. Okay, so um, you're about... 20, so you're starting around 22, 26, you're starting pharmacy school around 26. And did you, were you immediately thought of as a leader because you were maybe three, four years older than other students? Or was it you that came in and said, I just really want to uh, start in these leadership positions because it sounds like you started right away. Um, I know Tennessee is one of the best schools in the country. So uh, tell me a little bit about how you got into these leadership positions or how you developed during pharmacy school. Um, I've always been very driven. I've always wanted to be really involved. So as soon as I started at um, pharmacy school, I knew that I had to find a way at a big place like the University of Tennessee to sort of make my mark and get involved. Um, And I found that with APHA, ASP, they had so much going on, so many different projects that there was always a place for people to get involved. So I jumped right in with their service projects and then got involved as a College of Pharmacy ambassador. So giving tours to students that would come and interview at the University of Tennessee and sort of found just little positions around the school um, to sort of find my niche and decided I really loved APHA and that's where I wanted to spend my time. And I applied for the executive committee my second year in school there um, and then just sort of started moving up the ranks with an APHA. Okay. And I was just in San Francisco at the meeting. Uh, I hadn't been there for five or six years. I had three five-year-olds now, and and now was the time where I could get away. And I just, uh, I really missed it. It was very easy to go back and connect. And and I forgot just how how just amazing uh, APHA is. Uh, But during that time, certainly you've got um, some expertise that you've developed. Uh, What are two things that maybe you've learned as a pharmacist that I might not know. Uh, While I've been in practice 20 years, I find that every time I talk to someone, there's something that uh, they have an expertise about, um, especially with IPSF. I don't think a lot of people know about that. Yeah, so IPSF is the International Pharmaceutical Students Federation. So it's basically the international version of APHA ASP. A lot of students don't know 
know that by being a member of APHA ASP, you're automatically a member of IPSF. And one of the um, my favorite thing about IPSF actually is that they have their very own exchange program that's just for pharmacy students around the world. So any members of APHA ASP can apply for this program and choose to go um, during the summer to any of these other countries that have pharmacy programs that participate and do an exchange program anywhere from two weeks to 10 weeks and experience what it's like to practice pharmacy in another country. Wow. And I think you mentioned that you might not be an expert on something. So I think you're definitely an expert on this. Um, <laughs> how do you pick, though? Because here you go and you're like, OK, well, here's the catalog. You get the world. Uh, where would you uh, did, have you gone on one of these trips or uh, have uh, what what does drive someone to go to a certain country? So I was not able to participate in SEP while I was in school, but I served as the student exchange officer for APHA ASP. So I helped facilitate these exchanges for our students who wanted to go out and see the world and also for students from all the other countries that wanted to come to the United States. Um, there's about 70 different countries that you can choose from. And honestly, it's just whatever you've wanted to see in your life. So if you are just really interested in um, Africa or anywhere around the world, whatever draws you, um, you can go there for SEP more than likely. There's so many places that you can go. Um, you can also choose based on whether you want to do um, an industry or internship or um, hospital, community pharmacy. So there's a lot of different things that can help point you in that direction of where you want to go. I've heard people that have gone abroad have come back uh, with a different mindset or a different view and, and certainly being able to talk to people from abroad uh, certainly uh, provides that uh, as well. Um, let's shift gears for a little bit and kind of take you to maybe one of the uh, most difficult parts of your pharmacy journey where uh, many students, when they talk to people that have graduated from pharmacy school, it seems like it was all roses and it just worked out and it was just great, uh, just followed the curriculum sheet. You know, two years or four years of undergrad, then four years of grad, of grad school, became a pharmacist and lived happily ever after. What was your most difficult moment in pharmacy school? Um, so actually, my fourth year of pharmacy school, um, while I was at the APHA meeting um, in 2016, I found out that I had breast cancer. Oh, my God. And so I finished my um, last two rotations while I was undergoing chemotherapy. Um, and so just learning to transition from the um, the provider that we've been training for the last four years to be transitioning into that role of patient. Um, and so just trying to figure out how to how to balance that and come to terms with all that and figure out how I was going to go through treatment and finish pharmacy school and how that was going to impact my plans after pharmacy school um, and sort of began to see things in sort of a different light than I had when I started pharmacy school. I talked to, a, and this just sticks out, um, uh, it's a famous poet, a relatively famous poet, Ross Gay, said, the most difficult thing that you can do as a human being is fit in the shoes of another human being and understand their suffering. Um, how would you tell people after this experience, or maybe the pharmacists out there, how can we go from transactional, where here are your medicines for this disease, to truly empathetic and really understanding what it is that the patient is going through? Um, that was really big for me while I was going through all this. And um, I'm thankful that I had been through pharmacy school and had worked at a pharmacy and understood insurance companies and prescriptions and making appointments because there's just so many things that as a patient you're dealing with um, on a day-by-day -day basis that we don't really think about as providers a lot of times. And so just stopping for a moment to think about what the patient's going through, how many, um, you know, for us as pharmacists, how many prescriptions are those patients on? What other challenges are they dealing with in their life that might affect their drug therapy? Um, and then also just for me personally um, to come out of this and be able to talk to patients who are also going through chemotherapy or who are really struggling to maybe remember to take their medication every day and help them understand why it's so important, why we're doing this drug therapy. Yes, it's no fun to take these drugs every day, 
but what, you know, what are we preventing with this therapy? Um, and so I think it just gave, gave me another avenue to be able to talk to my patients at work. Um, and also in my residency coming up, um, I'm going to be working with kids who are going through this. And so I can say, man, I know this is no fun. I just did this a year ago. You know, I'm here for you. What can I do to help you? Here's what we're going to do with your medication. Here's what's going to happen. Um, and it just really gave me a lot of new perspective and new things um, to be able to connect with my patients. You're going to be a tremendous asset uh, for those kids. I, I absolutely know it. Um, but let's maybe transition a little bit to what you're looking forward to most right now. Uh, what is it that um, aside from residency coming up soon, what else do you have going on? Uh, my next big project is attending the World Health Assembly in Switzerland at the UN headquarters. So this is the annual meeting of the World Health Organization. And um, so member states and non-government organizations will be there. And IPSF sends a delegation every year to say what our statements are um, and represent the student pharmacists of the world. And I'm lucky enough to be part of the delegation this year. And so we'll be uh, um, creating some um, position statements for uh, the pharmacy world and going to share those with, um, with the World Health Organization and hopefully making an impact on, on future policies. I'm just trying to, to kind of encapsulate that you're going to Switzerland after not going to any countries during, you know, pharmacy school. Now you're going to the World Health Organization. You're meeting with the world uh, and uh, going uh, and uh, dealing with um, public health. And uh, I just think that's phenomenal. That's that's absolutely phenomenal. Well, what's maybe an epiphany that you've had where you thought of something differently um, after where, where something maybe changed where you thought something before and now maybe you think a little bit differently about things? Um, you know, before I got sick, I really thought that all the, all my mentors that I had looked, looked to during pharmacy school sort of all followed this same path from, you know, they go to pharmacy school, everything's perfect. You get out of pharmacy school, you go to residency, um, and then you just, you know, follow in this pre-made path to this dream career. And um, after I got sick, I realized that everybody has, everyone has their own path and it doesn't really matter how you get there. Each step along the way is going to teach you something. And so in this year, since I graduated, um, I've been working in the community and I've learned so much that's going to help me out um, as a resident. And so it really took this whole entire year for me to embrace my position where, you know, I, you know, I was devastated last year when I couldn't do the residency and being sick and everything. Um, and so just just embracing that everyone's path um, is different and that 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 that's OK. Yeah, I usually start every interview with everyone's path is a little different. But I think I may have to rethink that because the more I interview people, I keep finding that everyone's path is a lot different and that there is no cookie cutter fit. You know, maybe the curriculum is what we start with. But everyone's going to have their own road, their own people that they're going to uh, meet. Well, tell us a little bit more about the the residency that you're going into. Uh, people have matched. Uh, we're past the match date. Uh, and now some people are trying to go in the second match round, I think. But tell me what you know about residency because you are now July 1st, I think, is the start. And we're uh, beginning of April. So what are you doing to get ready for this residency? Um, well, first and foremost, I'm just trying to um, review things that I may have forgotten in the past year. Um, chemo brain is a real phenomenon that we laugh and joke about, but um, just making sure that I'm, I'm ready to go and ready for all the challenges of residency. Um, but also just being thankful that I've been given the opportunity for residency again this year. Um, and just I want to encourage anyone that, that didn't match for residency or um, you know, that thinks, well, now, you know, now what I didn't get a residency, what do I do now? Um, don't, don't give up. You know, I didn't, I didn't match last year. It was a, a blessing in disguise that I didn't, I wouldn't have been able to complete that residency, um, while I was sick. But, um, again, just coming through all of this and working for a year made me an even better residency candidate and just don't give up. If you think that residency is really for you, use this year to, um, 
to reevaluate how how can you improve yourself? What, what can you learn over the year? And maybe even find other programs that you didn't think you would have been interested in or um, determine your determine your own path. Again, we said everybody's path is a little different. So, um, you know, if you think if you think you're done, don't be, you know, do this, do the second match, do the scramble, apply again next year. Um, so just always, always keep working to improve yourself. Um, and so really that's what I'm doing right now. I'm just trying to, trying to make sure I'm ready for that challenge. Um, I'm going to be moving to the East coast, um, away from the South for the first time in my life. I'll be at a children's hospital in Norfolk, Virginia at children's hospital of the King's daughters. So also trying to mentally, um, switch from the community world to being with kids every day. And I'm, I'm really excited about that. I think it's going to be a fun time. So tell me how you feel that your role will change with the pharmacy organizations because you're doing something in a little bit different order, but you're going from student in pharmacy organization to retail pharmacist or student organization to resident in uh, pharmacy organization. What do you see your role being as a resident uh, next year? Um, I think I'll still be just as involved. I think I'll just probably be a little more tired than I was. <laughs> um, um, but just stay involved. Most organizations give you, you know, that three to five year grace period where you're considered a new practitioner and you can still sort of, um, I guess, play on both teams as far as you can be on the student organization side, but then also in the, the pharmacy, um, the pharmacist organization. So um, just do some research, see where you fit in um, and st- stay involved however you would like. Um, I think for right now, I'll probably still be involved on the student side. Um, IPSF is a student organization. Um, and so you have four years after you graduate to stay involved with that. So um, I think a lot of my time is still going to be spent with IPSF. But I've loved my year as a new practitioner mentor for the University of Tennessee for APHA. Um, and I feel like not only do I get to give back, but I also have moved into this new role of um, where I'm sort of on the advisor side of the student organizations and have gotten to work with, with um, my advisors from when I was a student and learn from them, but also grow in that advisor and mentor role, which I think is really important for new graduates. Um, something that we've touched on in a number of episodes is ambulatory care. Ambulatory care seems to be a very good place for pharmacists to be, to work at the top of their uh, license. My wife works at the VA doing that kind of thing. But tell me what pediatric ambulatory care might look like. I just listened to uh, TED Radio Hour and I heard a little bit about what it was like to be a physician who was focused on pediatric pain uh, and uh, those types of conditions. What would it be like to be a pediatric ambulatory care pharmacist, do you think? Um, my first exposure to that was at the St. Jude Children's Research Hospital here in Memphis. Um, I was lucky enough to get a rotation there in pharmacy school, and I was in the hematology clinic there. And so every day we saw children that had sickle cell or hemophilias or different blood disorders. Um, and we would have appointments with these patients just like they would with the physician for that day or whoever they were seeing. They would also have a pharmacy appointment. And so we would talk about their medication therapy. Do they need any refills? What's been going on in their life? Um, how are things going? And just a normal, what we think of as a normal doctor's appointment, um, they had also with pharmacy. And so St. Jude has clinics for um, HIV. They have hematology clinic. Um, and many children's ho- children's hospitals around the country have clinics like this. And so that was just a great experience for me to be able to get to know these children on a longitudinal basis and see um, what's going on in their life, how they've grown, and how, as a pharmacist, we can help um, with the things in their life, how that determines their um their medication therapy. So a lot of things that we, you know, we don't think about, but um, if they, you know, we had patients who didn't even have running water at their house. So that made it really difficult for them to be able to take medication or if they had medication that was supposed to be dissolved and then drank, well, they couldn't do that. They didn't have running water. And so just working with them to be able to provide the best care, 
Um, and I just loved the clinic atmosphere, um, getting to know these kids. Um, you know, a lot of times in school, we just see the patient for a few days in the hospital. And once they leave, we don't really see them again. And that's really what drew me to the clinic side was getting to getting to build a relationship with these patients and see them month after month. I hear over and over again that seeing progress in some form or another is what really leads to some kind of satisfying uh, career. My daughters were in the NICU for uh, 11 weeks, and uh, I just remember how uh, every little every little victory was just uh, so important, and it was just nice to see the same nurses, the same doctors over and over again. And uh, it became our second home. I was there three times uh, a day. My wife was there most of the day, each day. Uh, so I absolutely understand the joy that you could get from uh, something like that. Well, what kind of blanket advice might you have for someone wanting to get where you are? Because you've uh, taken this road, you've persisted. Um, what advice do you have for them? Um, just get involved. Just get involved now. Um, it's never too early. It's never too late. So whether um, you're about to start pharmacy school or you've been in pharmacy school for three years, find that niche where um, where you really feel like you belong, something that brings you joy. Just get involved um, and then do your own research. Don't limit your involvement to things on your own campus. So if you're really interested in global public health or travel or anything, even if your school doesn't have an IPSF chapter, you can still be involved with that. Um, there's so many different great pharmacy organizations, and every college of pharmacy can't have chapters for all of these. So sort of do your own research and find what you make what makes you happy and see how you can get involved there. Well, I know people would want to uh, talk to you or, or ask you about your story and the way that you've done things. Um, how do you prefer people uh, contact you? We met through um, Facebook Messenger, and I'm finding that I thought Twitter would be the way people contact me, but I'm finding Facebook Messenger is absolutely the, the way that people contact me. How would you prefer people contact you? Yeah, Facebook is fine. Email is fine. Um, I also have a blog um, that I do called um, Faith, Trust, and Pixie Dust, the um, transition from patient to provider. Um, so any, please check out my blog. Please contact me. Reach out to me at all. I love, I love talking to people and, and making new friends and relationships. So. What's the URL for the blog? Because the title isn't the same as the URL, if I remember right. Um, I, I think it's faithtrustpixiedust.com dot wordpress dot com okay. um but then in the word trust it, it's rx instead okay. of just t-r-u-s-t okay. so just the way drake university uses drugs <laughs> d-r-x-u-g-s or something like that so yeah yep. okay uh well let's just uh, do a couple of quick questions i won't uh, interrupt these uh one what's your best ritual to keep your work on track i write down everything best career if something doesn't yeah uh -huh. <laughs> Oh, sorry. Go no, ahead. No, no, no. No, go ahead. <laughs> oh no! It just—I have to. I write down everything. If something doesn't get done one day, then I write it down again the next day, and that's. I just. I keep. It keeps everything moving. Keeps my momentum going forward, and that way you don't get discouraged if you didn't get something done the previous day. Just keep moving. Keep going. What's the best career advice you've ever received? To forge your own path. Just make it work. Make do what makes you happy, um, and don't don't try to follow the path that someone before you cut. Just forge your own path. And what inspires you? My family and all the patients I've interacted with. Well, thank you so much for being on the Pharmacy Podcast. I I know that your story is going to be inspirational to our listeners, and uh, just personally having three children that. Uh, really struggled to breathe, really struggled uh, to make it into this world, uh, I know that uh, other people will appreciate it as well. Yeah, thank you so much for having me. I had a really great time. Thanks for listening to the Pharmacy Future Leaders Podcast with your host, Tony Guerra. Be sure to share the show with the hashtag Pharmacy Future Leaders.